This lecture has to do with market structure, and in particular, we're going, to, we're going to be talking about market structure that's not perfect competition and not monopoly. And so when you think about it, perfect competition is a idealistic situation where uh, there is many, many firms, perfect flow of information, uh, perfect entry and exit. So it's the ultimate example of competition. And then the other one we examined earlier was called monopoly, which there's no company. So what do you have between perfect and zero competition? You have imperfect competition. And that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about market structure that is uh, that that has competition, but it is not perfect like monopoly. And so uh, like uh, it's not perfect like a perfect competition. And here is the perfect one. Let me just bring up my highlighter here. Perfect. No competition. And everything in between is imperfect competition. And in particular, we're going to be talking about oligopoly. Now, oligopoly, I consider to be the most important category of market structure the re uh, for three reasons. Or th there are three reasons why it's unique. One, it's more realistic. There are many, many uh, industries that fall under the oligopoly uh, category. Second, uh, price and output tend to be more stable in this market structure than other market structures. And thirdly, the this particular uh, market structure um, has the first market structure where we had to deal with strategy. Um, in other words, interdependency is an issue here. When I say interdependency, I mean when one firm makes a decision or a choice, it affects other firms and they're going to react to it. So think about perfect competition. When one firm acted, let's say they decided to, to increase output, other firms didn't react because each firm in this industry is very small so nobody notices what they're doing therefore there's no reaction there's no really need to plan for a counter strategy depending upon what your rivals will do here there are no rivals so there's no need to think about counter strategies in this one you do have to think of counter strategies so strategy becomes a much more important part of this so to recap three things that make this oligopoly special three things that make this market structure special. One, it's more realistic. Two, uh, price and output tend to be more stable in this market structure than other market structures. And third, strategy matters. Now, again, I like to put market structure in the uh, framework of the SCP model. S for structure, P for performance, C for conduct. And what this uh, model tells you is when one of the three elements changes, the other two change. So you've got this kind of uh, uh, feedback loop. So if firms hop into an industry, it changes market structure. What this SCP model says is performance will then change and behavior in the industry will change. And it doesn't have to originate, change does not have to originate here. It could originate in performance or conduct, meaning there could be a change in conduct and that could lead to a change in structure and it could lead to a change in performance. We're simply focusing our attention on change originating in structure. So let's go over monopoly. Um, more realistic, interdependency, and stable output. So I talked about those three things earlier. Um, so up until now, one common aspect of firms has been the lack of interest in strategy of rivals. And this one, in this particular industry, is no longer the case. Now, you have to take into account what your rivals will do when you do something. And this is one of the reasons why we introduce uh, game theory when we talk about oligopoly. Because since strategy is so important in oligopolistic market structures, um, game theory is a mathematical way to talk about strategy. So this is one of the reasons why we introduce game theory is to deal with the strategic issues 
associated with, with oligopoly and market structure. So in an oligopoly, you, there are several large firms. Now, there could be thousands of firms in an oligopoly market structure. It's just three or four control most of the market. And because you've got three or four firms with large market share, they have market power, meaning they could use their supply to impact market price. Now, so when in an oligopoly, when one firm is setting output, it must take into account the reactions of its competitors. So if you decide to increase output, what will your rival do? If you decrease output, what will your rival do? And this is what we call interdependency. One firm's actions impact another firm's. Now, how do you measure market power? Well, there are two main measurements of market power. One is called the concentration ratio. This is the most simplistic uh, measurement of market power. And basically what you do is you take the four largest firms in a market, in terms of market share, and add them up. And that if that number is roughly 70% or greater, we consider that to be an oligopolistic territory. So take a look at this. Uh, these are types of industries, right? And these are basically broadly defined and narrowly defined industries. For example, beer is broadly defined uh, industry. And then video game consoles, that's a narrowly defined industry. But it shows you the four largest firms, and if you add up their market share, this is what they have. And so all of these industries have a market share or concentration ratio 70% uh, or greater, which puts it in oligopolistic territory. Let me give you a nice, interesting graphic that kind of shows this. Well, um, an industry that demonstrates this, the beer industry. So if you broadly define beer in the United States and you look at the four largest firms, and that's going to be Anheuser-Busch, InBev, um, Coors, let's believe it's called SAB now, uh, Pabst, Blue Ribbon, and Miller, uh, they will give you over 70%. And so I would place the market structure position along the spectrum in the United States right around here. Now, what about China? Well, China is the world's largest beer market. Um, and this is data in 2009. So you can see this circle here represents hectoliters of beer. So you can see it's the United States is second, uh, China's first, third is uh, Germany. But if you look at their uh, four largest firms in China, uh, you'll, you'll discover it's a highly fragmented market. China Resource Enterprise uh, Brewer, it's called Snow, uh, has 21% of the market. And so I would place it right around here if you add up the four largest firms. So the United States market structure is over here, China's over here. Now here's an interesting graphic. Uh, take a look at uh, soft drinks. And this is broadly defined. And you've got Coca-Cola, Pepsi, and Dr. Pepper Snapple Group. And the circles represent their market share. So you got 42.8, 31, and this is 15. And so this is greater than 70%. But what you see all around it are all of the different brands or products these companies produce. So even though there are three large firms, there's still a significant number of a level of competition. Let me zoom in on Coca-Cola here. And you can see uh, here are all of the different products Coca-Cola produces. I'm going to zoom in even further right here. Bring that up. And you can see just for the Coca-Cola um, label, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 different products under the Coca-Cola label. Then you got Mr. Pip, Fresca, Sprite. So even though oligopolies are not a monopoly, there is still 
significant competition. So in our next video, we're going to be talking about some particular models in oligopoly. In particular, we're going to be talking about the Sweezy or kink demand curve model.